Hello and welcome to you all for tonight's District 73 Education and Training Session. Lovely to see you and I believe we've got someone here from Launceston which is super fabulous when we see what Zoom can do to bring the district together. There may be others from Central who may be joining in as well but wherever you are, whatever room in your house you're in, whether you're doing the ironing, hopefully not, hopefully you're watching this really closely, uh, welcome to you all. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Annie Martin and I'm the Chair of the Education and Training Team. Tonight we will be having a session that goes for about 90 minutes and halfway through there will be a 10 minute break so you can go and get a quick cuppa if you need be. This idea originally began for Accents Accentuate Your Toastmasters Club. That idea originally began with Janine one and I'd like to give credit there, uh, conversations that she's had with Fiona. So those two powerhouse women, it's really their idea and it's just my privilege to get on their coattails, if you like, and be able to present it tonight. I could not present it if it weren't for people like Graham Dunlop, who is there being our Zoom master. He's going to look a bit like a timer tonight, but behind that you will find Graham with his big beard, I reckon, if he's still got it. I wasn't sure, but I reckon he's still got that big beard behind there. Yes, he does. So he's going to be flushing different colours tonight in order to keep Fiona's on track, in order to keep Hanif on track. The session tonight is going to be really a combination of interview style because we find this works just so well, interview style and some interactive activities as well. The other people I would like to thank is Elaine Doyle. She's a bit of an unsung hero in that she gets together a lot of the promotion for education and training, and I'd really like to thank her for that as well. And, of course, massively to Fiona and Hanif. They're massively busy people, as you're going to hear. They're really talented people. They're great Toastmasters, and I know how much work that they have put into this session. I do know Fiona has been travelling straight back from Malaysia and she's landed in an airport today. So really these people are working incredibly hard to present this here tonight. Now, Hanif will be introducing Fiona properly. So I'll leave that for the minute and it'll be my privilege to introduce Hanif, who then in turn will introduce Fiona. Hanif, what can I say about Hanif? Well, okay, let me tell you a little bit of background. He came out to Australia seven years ago and he came to Melbourne and more than that, he came to Toastmasters straight away, he said. He said he's been joined at the hip with Toastmasters ever since. And at his height of Toastmastering, he was a member of five clubs. Whew. Now, he's distilled that right down and now he's a member of one club, which is Wandon. There's a few Wandon members here tonight, so... He's in a great club, but I won't say any more about that. We love having him at Wandon, and he actually does, as Nola said a bit earlier, he does actually ride his bike out, I don't know how many kilometres, but he is one enormously committed Toastmaster. I do know, I'm going to slightly embarrass him and say I do remember just parts of a speech he gave many years ago where it was like he was alluding to the fact that there was this sort of other woman and why he was out every night of the week, and we thought, oh, he's telling us something, but... Really, he was telling us about, well, the Toast Mistress, if you like. He was telling us about all the clubs that he's visiting and, and the hold that Toastmasters had on his life. The other thing to know about Hanif is that he really is Superman. So by day, he's like Clark Kent, okay? He's an accountant. He's full-time accountant. But by night, woohoo, that's when the real Hanif comes to light and he teaches English seven nights a week and we will be hearing more about that as Fiona flips the interview for a little bit and starts to ask Hanif a question and we get to hear about the remarkable things that Hanif does on a practical level. He also has an impressive set of qualifications. He's recently got a graduate diploma in education from Melbourne University and a qualification in English as a second language teaching certificate from RMIT. He's quite the guy. He's a guy of many, of much cultural diversity himself, whether it's Malaysian, Pakistani, Australian. And of course, one of the things that I will always refer to when I talk about Hanif or to Hanif 
is his love of anything Russian. Now, who would think? But yes, this guy knows more about Russian history, Russian literature than just about anyone I know. He also knows how to pronounce Dostoevsky. Now, I hope I did a good job with that. He, I'm sure he'll tell me. But look, he's, I'm going to hand it straight over to this man now. He's going to tell us about pronunciation. He's going to tell us about accents. And he is going to kickstart our education and training session for tonight. I know you're on mute, but but clap anyway to please join me in welcoming Hanif Akbar. Thanks, Annie. Such a wonderful introduction. You set the bar really high. Now I have to try very hard to live up to it. Now, good evening, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Tonight, I have a privilege of introducing a very remarkable individual. When I say remarkable, I truly mean it. In the field of cross-cultural communication, she is a bit of a phenomenon, a bit of a powerhouse, and a bit of a giant. She has not five, not 10, but over 20 years experience in helping individuals, companies, and universities effectively communicate in cross-cultural communication. Now, she also has educational qualification to match. She holds Bachelor of Art degree from Adelaide University, a diploma in writing from Victoria University, and a PhD in cross-cultural communication, cross-cultural psychology from University of Melbourne. Tonight, she will share insight and practical advice on how to manage and harness cultural diversity in Toastmaster Club. I'm, I'm sure we we'll all will walk away with new perspectives and new tools. Please, everyone, join me to give a massive round of applause to Fiona Price. Uh, oh, thank you, Hanif. Fiona, that's, that's welcome. That's a sumptuous introduction. Thank you. And thanks for taking time out to join us here and agreeing to generously share your insights. I did leave a lot out in describing you earlier, and I would like to start by getting to know you a little bit more. Perhaps you could give us a brief synopsis of who you are and what you do. Over to you, Fiona. Ah, thank you, Hanif. Well, probably the best place to start is at the very, very beginning which is when my father, who is an Anglo-Australian man, went to Malaysia as, a as an Australian volunteer abroad and came home with a Malaysian Chinese wife. So cross-cultural communication was very much something that I grew up with. I grew up with two different accents and swapping from using a Malaysian accent with my mother to using Australian accent with, with my father. So cross-cultural communication and swapping from accent to accent was something I did throughout my childhood. And it didn't really occur to me that having grown up in a bicultural family might eventually be a great career option until I got to university. So there I was at Adelaide University and I realised suddenly that a lot of the international students were coming in, who were coming in, and at that stage there weren't nearly as many as there are now, but even so there were a lot of them who were from East and Southeast Asia. And as a mother who is Chinese by ethnicity, which is East Asian, and Malaysian by citizenship, which is Southeast Asian, I found myself ideally placed on the fence where I could help them, help the Westerners on the, on the Anglo-Australian side understand the Asians and help the Asians understand the Australians. So I started working in uh, international student support, uh, beginning with uh, simple jobs like picking students up at the airport and taking them around, around Adelaide, where I was living at the time, and running little orientation sessions that teach them about Australian society and culture. And eventually, when I moved back to Melbourne, where I grew up, I only went to Adelaide when I was 17 and spent a few years there. When I came back to Melbourne, I continued working with international students. And eventually, when I was doing my PhD in cross-cultural psychology, started doing this professionally. So running workshops and doing lots of facilitation, which also provides a bit of background for where the public speaking comes from. So I've very much been doing a lot of public speaking since the beginning of my career. But as I was finishing my PhD, I was suddenly and unexpectedly promoted to manager, which was a bit of a shock to me because I was very young, and asked to come up with initiatives to support internationals, support staff in their work with international students. 
and I interviewed lots of staff about how they how I could support them with cross cultural communication. And to my surprise, once I interviewed them, two main issues came out and one was great difficulty in pronouncing and using Asian names, which was a quite a surprise. It wasn't something I'd expected and things that I had expected, which was things like managing language barriers, uh, managing cultural barriers and just communicating effectively with somebody who's coming to Australia as an international student. And that's a that's a challenge, which is also very, very relevant, as all of us attending this session will know, to being in a Toastmasters club, which tends to attract people from all around the world, partly because Toastmasters is a, is a great way to meet local people, and partly because it's also an excellent platform for people who are not native English speakers to work on their English. In terms of my own career in Toastmasters, that came many years later. So after I'd moved into Williamstown, for example, I thought to myself, I'd like to make, make some friends with locals. And I thought about what sort of things I could do. And I thought to myself, you know, I do a lot of public speaking for work, but I'd like to have the chance to talk about something other than cross-cultural communication. And I remember my uncle George, my mother's oldest sibling, was a member of something called Toastmasters. And I, so I looked it up and was pleased to discover there was a Toastmasters club about five minutes drive away from where I lived. So I ended up joining that Toastmasters club and that was in 2014. And here I still am 10 years later, now providing an educational seminar for you. Now, in terms of other things that might be interesting to talk about, one of the things that I've developed a lot more since starting at Toastmasters, I've, I've sort of moved on from just doing training programs on cross-cultural communication and multicultural names. Since joining Toastmasters, I realised I could spread my public speaking wings a little further. In the last few years, I've started doing keynote speeches, one of which I was talking a little bit about before we started the session proper, which is I actually gave a presentation in Bali about how Toastmasters is a very supportive environment for creating cross-cultural connections. So one of the things that um, I'd like to talk a little bit about tonight is just what we can do to support people who come from other cultures and make sure that we manage the language and cultural barriers they face and provide an excellent environment for them to learn more about how to adjust to Australian society and also teach people who've grown up in Australian society about some of the other cultures that we get, in, we get to have contact with via our Toastmasters meetings. Thank you, Fiona. Very fascinating. Now, Fiona, you mentioned about uh, William Town Toastmaster Club, and and I want to congr congratulate you on tenth your tenth anniversary being at uh, William Town Toastmaster Club. Congratulations! Thank now, you. most of us, if you are like me, you would have known Fiona from through district contests, and that's how I came to know Fiona for the first time, and that's a, that's a good reason for that. That was because in almost you will see her in almost every district contest, and I met her in in, uh, in in one of the district contests, and she has won numerous accolades, and amongst them is she has been a district champion in table topic contest, and she had also placed second in international contests at district level, district seventy three, and she had numerous other achievements as well. Now you coined one of the phrase that Toastmaster is a ticket to the world. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like you to expand more on this. What did you mean by Toastmaster being a ticket to the world? Or to you, Fiona? Well, not only does Toastmasters have a very multicultural um, member base in Australia, so you can go to your local club and encounter people from all around the world and engage with them on a personal level, which can often be difficult to do out in society in people's everyday lives but it also via Toastmasters International opens up the opportunity to make local connections almost anywhere in the world. So one of the things I think needs to be showcased a little more in Toastmasters is the fact that as a Toastmasters member, you can go to almost any country in the world and look up whereabouts Toastmasters meetings are being held and meet local people. So this is something that I've done in Malaysia, I've done this in Taiwan, and I did this in Ireland. So when I was when I was in all three of these countries, I found myself traveling often for work or because I needed because in the case of Taiwan, I was keen to go and have a look at at, uh, at the society there. And I didn't know anybody there. So I was traveling on my own. So what I did was I went onto the Toastmasters International website and they have a very useful search engine called Find a Club. And I thought to myself, hmm, 
I'm going to be in Taiwan for three days. Let me put down the nights, the nights of the week this are. So I went in to find a club and I said I wanted to have it within 10 kilometres of the hotel where I was staying. And a, a, a club that met on either a Wednesday, a Thursday or a Friday. And so using the Finder Club, I was in, got put in touch with two Toastmasters clubs and I ended up visiting both of them for two meetings. And through that, not only did I get to meet native English, well, native Mandarin speakers that I could attempt my Mandarin with, uh, but they were people who could speak good English and they gave me a lot of interesting insights about whereabouts I could go. So thanks to my local contacts that I met through through uh, the Toastmasters clubs in Malaysia, in Taiwan and in Ireland, I found out about free city walking tours that are on offer to tourists. I found about whereabouts the best place to buy noodles were, best places to buy noodles were. And in the case of Ireland, I found out a lot about whereabouts to go sightseeing and was told about a local lantern festival that was going on. So it really did open up the world for me and enabled me to do something which is often quite difficult to do when you're traveling as a tourist, and that is engage with the local people and familiarize yourself firsthand with the sort of lives and the culture that they have there. Thanks, Suna. That's a great tip. I have personally done it myself. I have traveled and attended Toastmaster clubs around the world. And it, it, it really opens up your eye when you at attend these uh, local clubs around the world. Now, Fiona, you have written an article, a very intriguing article in, in Toastmaster International magazine back in 2022, talking about cultural diversity in Toastmaster Club. And one of the phrases you coined then was Toastmaster being microcosm of global diversity. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like you to give us some examples of where you've seen cultural differences manifesting in how people communicate in Toastmaster setting. So perhaps you could give us some example or two, Fiona. Well, some of the things that I observe quite often, one of the first things that is very obvious to me is the fact that when we announce a Toastmaster's speech, we have to, we announce them by name. So we give the person's name and the title of their speech. And that makes it very apparent when someone's reading out a name from a language they're not familiar with, how difficult it is to pronounce things. And because this is one of the topics that I specialize in in my own work, I find that um, one of the things I like to do is support my fellow members in how to pronounce the names of members who don't have Anglo-Saxon names. So that's one of the areas where cross-cultural communication is front and center as soon as you walk into the club and as soon as the, the Toastmaster begins to speak. Some of the other things that you'll see is differences in the way people structure structure uh, speeches, depending on what their first language is. Now, something that not many native English speakers know is that information is organised differently depending on what language you're speaking in. And the language barrier I work with most often is English to Chinese. And we know that we have a lot of Chinese members coming to Toastmasters, many of whom like to come to Toastmasters to improve their English. So through Toastmasters, I gave, a, I gave a session online to a group of people who were in the south of China, in I think um, Guangdong in southern China. Through that, I actually found myself a Chinese conversation partner. And one of the things she used to do is give speeches to me in, um, as a way of practicing them before she gave them at competitions and gave them at her club. And an interesting thing that I noticed was that the way she organized the information in her speeches tended to be very much targeted to the way a Chinese audience would see it. For example, what you tend to see in Chinese is that it's different that where you put the most important piece of information is different from the way where we put it in English. In English, we would usually say, I closed the door because it was cold. So you say what you did first, you put the point first, and then you give the reason second. Whereas in Chinese, you would tend to say, because it was cold, so I closed the door. So what you'll tend to see in a Chinese person giving a speech who hasn't yet learned about the rules of English discourse, where you're expected to put the point first, is that they'll be giving background information at the end of the paragraph is where they'll put the key information. And English speakers find this quite confusing because they're looking for the point in the first or second sentence of the paragraph. So one of the things I would do with my Chinese friend Linda is she would give her speeches to me and I'd ask her, so Linda, who is the audience for this speech? Are they going to be Chinese people? Or are they going to be Westerners? And she said, mostly they're going to be Westerners at my club, a mixture of Westerners and a few Asians, but all of whom speak English professionally. So one of the things I would do is I'd teach her how to restructure her speech so that it would be more effective in terms of information management for her English speaking audience. So that's another place which is interesting. 
Something else that came up comes up quite often in cross-cultural communication, which is also relevant to, toast to Toastmasters, is the use of silence. Now, something we talk about often in Toastmasters meetings and uh, in terms of how to make your speech effective is to learn how to make less of those filler noises like um and ah and you know and so on, and instead learn, to have, learn the power of the pregnant pause. So pausing dramatically, leaving your audience room to react emotionally to what you're speaking about and so on. And the fact of the matter is, it's not that obvious to people who have been mostly in an English speaking Toastmasters club, but people who, who are in different societies also have different levels of tolerance for silence. And the thing about native English speakers, one of the reasons why pauses are so powerful in an English speaking in an English speech is because English speakers are generally fairly intolerant of silence. We usually find a pause of more than about two or three seconds becomes what we call an uncomfortable silence. So let me just show you, I'll give I'll pause for six seconds and I'll show you just how uncomfortable that feels for a native English speaker. Okay, starting now. Now that's only five seconds, but you can see how people are starting to sort of feel a bit uncomfortable already. And that's why in English we have all these idioms like it was a pregnant pause, there was a pregnant pause, there was an awkward moment. It's because for native English speakers, silence is intrinsically awkward. But one of the things I discovered, especially when I was uh, staying in China, I studied in China for six months, I had a lot of Japanese friends. I didn't realize it at the time, but the reason why my Japanese friends would be frustratingly slow to respond is because in Japan, it's quite normal to have a silence of, you know, even, even 10 seconds in conversation. So when I dated a Japanese guy for a while, I'd be sitting there asking him something, and he'd be, eh, to. I'd be sitting there waiting, you know, hurry up, hurry up, come on. And it wasn't until later when I was studying cross-cultural communication that I understood that his frustrating slowness to respond to me was partly because I, as a native English speaker, wanted a quick response, two or three seconds answer, whereas he felt it was quite appropriate and even respectful to meditate carefully on his answer for you know, seven or eight seconds, which for a native English speaker is almost is heading towards pausing for a minute to honor the dead. It's something we really find difficult to deal with. So he would he would be pausing and then finally he'd come back to his answer. So one of the things that we may find, especially when we're in an international competition, perhaps on the international stage, is that people from different language groups may actually have differences in the way they use silence and have differences in the way they organize information. Some of the other things, which we'll be touching on a bit later in this in this uh, in this webinar, are the way the way we phrase things. Because what we tend to see is people will phrase English if it's their second language using the kind of intonation pattern. So that's the way you pitch your voice, and often the same structures and vocab that they'd use in their native language. So what they're effectively doing is saying a sentence in their native language and changing every word into English. And because languages are structured differently, it may not come across the way they hope it does when they've translated it into English. So a lot of the things that we see when there are people who are not native English speakers in our club really comes from the fact that your native language tends to shape the way you speak your second language. Thanks, Fiona. Very fascinating. I wish now that when I first came to Australia, I would I had joined William Town Toastmaster Club. I would definitely I've gained a lot of insight or, or help from you. Thanks, Fiona. Mm. But also, Hanif, I believe that teaching people who are not native English speakers to speak English and looking at the influence of their first language on their second language is something you have a lot of personal familiarity with yourself. So I believe that you teach your family members how to speak English. Yes, that's right, Fiona. I've been teaching my family daily uh, English classes for past two years now. And I have about 20 to 25 students and we, we run three classes daily, one run by me at night from 10 to 12 Australian time and two classes run by my, uh, my niece. So some of my students actually attend class classes twice daily. So the, let me just start first by telling you the size of my family and that because that leads to how I came up with the idea of, of having English class, starting English class. So I have a very big family. And when I say big, I mean with a capital B. And my father had 16 children. 
and those 16 of them had about 60 grandchildren and those grandchildren had another 60 great grandchildren so all in all we are 150 150 people descending from my father now i'm a strong believer in the idea that you should make a lem lemonade when you are given a lemon so at some point i realized that i could perhaps make use of this big family and and try to to think about creating a family toastmaster club but to get there, we had to first start with learning English language. And we're hoping in perhaps two years, another two years time, we'll be able to come up with our own club. Now, as to the motivation, how I started off with the idea of starting English class, I started off with a very selfish motive. I I saw some teaching, uh, teaching uh, teachers, Toastmasters in, in Melbourne clubs who were really good with their presentation skill. And I was really impressed. So I thought if I could become a teacher just like them, then I could become a very good presenter. And I just want to give a shout out to those teachers who were my role model. One was Annie Martin and the other was Joe Evans. Shout out to you both. And of course, our motivation, uh, why we do things, just like uh, why we joined Toastmaster, also change over time. And over time, I realized that there are a lot of other benefits uh, from the English class. And as somebody said that, if if something is really important, you do it regardless of the chance of success. Some of my students are improving and some are not, but then at the end of the day, it is something worth doing regardless of, of rate of success because it's such an important thing. And and this is a wild idea. 30 years ago, this have been, would have been impossible to do without the technology that we have. Thanks to technology like Zoom, somebody in a remote village in Pakistan can now join English class with me, uh, me sitting in Melbourne daily. And my students are of diverse age. They're all close members of my family. My sister is 60 years old. She's the oldest um, uh, student we have. And the youngest uh, youngest student we have is about 12 years old. And uh, like I said, our long-term goal is to create a, a toast, uh, to come up with our own family Toastmaster Club. Now, while teaching English to them, I also came across a lot of cultural differences and uh, in, 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 in teaching them different uh, concept from English language. I'll give you an example. Let's take an example of a uh, concept called false friends. Now trying to explain to them false friend can be tricky because false friends, if you translate into their language, it can come across either as a wrong friends or as a fake friends. There are two different meanings. They, so this is where the culture differences come into play and, and make things slightly more complicated. So this brings us now to our next activity. And this is where we might need your help, Fiona, mm -hmm. to perhaps give us some more examples of, of what are the differences like this that we tend to come across when we, we are in a multicultural setting. Over to you, Fiona. Well, one of the things which a lot of native English speakers find difficult is managing language barriers because a lot of native English speakers only speak English. It's one thing for me who grew up in a fairly bicultural or multicultural setting to be able to understand those things, but it's much harder for someone who's never spoken another language to any real level to figure out what to do if they've got a Toastmasters member perhaps who's struggling a little bit with English. And some of it uh, can simply come down to the type of words we use and how we use them. So one of the things that one of the things I like to do when I'm running sessions on cross cultural communication is help English speakers become a bit more aware of what it is about their native language that can be difficult for people who are not native English speakers. Because that's something that they're often just guessing at. It's, it's not clear to them because they haven't had to speak another language which isn't their first themselves. And one of the exercises I like to do is an exercise which involves getting a native English speaker and taking away their normal means of communication, which is of course, saying a word in English. So in this next activity, what I'm going to do is pick out a couple of native English speakers from the audience and take away their natural form of communication, which is speech in English, and get them to communicate a word or phrase using some other form of communication. So what other sorts of communication can you use if you're not using words? Well, there are two games that we use in a, that are quite popular in Australia, which both involve communication without words, showing rather than telling. 
One of those is charades, and that's well known across the world. So it can be used in, even in a multicultural setting. When people have to act out the word, they can do things like one word, two words, how many syllables by putting, putting fingers on their wrist and so on, and communicate by acting out the word or the title of a, of a movie or a phrase or something. The other popular game in which people communicate without words is Pictionary, where people will draw a picture of something and the idea is that people in the audience will guess what it is based on what they've drawn. So what I'd now like to do is get some volunteers from the audience and we'll slip them some words and phrases and everybody present can have a go at trying to guess the word they're trying to communicate over Zoom. So this is an exercise I've used quite often and it works quite nicely on a webinar. So long as people have something to draw and they can put up there and so long as we can see their hands and their face. So if they're doing charades, we can see them. All right, so do we have some volunteers from the audience who are interested? Oh yes, we have a few. Okay, Judy, we have Judy. And who else do we have here? We've got some very keen ones here. We've got Judy, we've got Joe, and who else have we got here? We have got, ooh, hang on, I've got, to, I've got to go through, but make sure I'm not favoring people on page one. And we have Janine. And Rihanna. All right, well, we've got three volunteers. I, I reckon we could probably manage three, Annie. So I'm gonna get Annie to slip, why don't we start with Judy, to slip a word or phrase to Judy. And I'll, I'll get Graham to spotlight Judy, and then Judy can try and communicate this word to us without using any words herself, by acting it out or by doing Pictionary. So, Judy, Judy, you ready? Okay, so if you can take, we can probably keep you on mute, although you are allowed to make sound effects as long as there are no words in them. She may need to just ask a clarifying question. Is that right, Judy? Sure, sure, yep, yeah, sure. T t you're welcome to take yourself off mute for a bit, Judy, just so that we can communicate effectively. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Could you please clarify what it is? <laughs> yeah. All right, what so have you, have, have, have you received your word? Oh, okay, so someone's got to send me a word. Is that what it is? And I've got oh, to a word out. or phrase. So have you said okay. the word, Annie? Yeah, yes, I've said the word, Judy. Okay. All oh, right. Okay. 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 All right. So your job is to communicate that word or phrase without using words by using actions, as in a charade, or by drawing a picture for us, as in Pictionary. Okay. I'm going to go right. for the picture, and I can tell you I'm the world's worst drawer, artist, okay. whatever you yeah. want to call it. Do we have Judy yeah. on spotlight? I can't tell from my screen. We do? Okay. Excellent. All right, everybody, let's see how Judy goes. I know you don't want me to draw lots and lots, so I'll just start off with that and see how we go. Oh, yeah. Can we still see? Can we still see? No, not with the virtual background. Just move back a bit, Judy. Right. That's it. Stop uh, there. Yep. Houses, village, flats, city, a city, Melbourne, city. Skyscraper, mega city, <laughs> New York. <laughs> There's a little yeah, disc cool. below it, yeah. Central Park. Park? Hang on, I'm going to have to take off the background. Um, are you going to see the mess in my house? <laughs> Oh, same with me. Is it a is it a pond, Judy? No, no. Is it a pond? I'd say pond? the MCG. Oh. 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 Rod Laver Arena. Stadium. <laughs> CBD. Oh. Track. Oh, CBD. Yes, CBD. What was that? CBD. Somebody CBD. said CBD. Beautiful. Natalie. Okay, well done. Well done, Julie, and well done, Natalie. Oh, well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Excellent. Terrific drawings. All right, then. Let's slip one to Janine next, I think. Hey, Janine, you've received your word or phrase? Not in chat. Was it by a chat? Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. 
No. All right. Now you may oh. want to move your move your camera down a little so that we can see you if you're going to do a charade. Oh, I have to think about this. Okay. Um, One word. Three words. Three words. Three words. Three words. First Three word. First word. No. Second word. Second word. Tongue. <laughs> Rude. A tongue. Tongue. Something tongue something. Tongue and groove. Um, Third word. Horns. Silly. Uh, this is being recorded. It's good to me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Picking. Um, blue tongue lizard. Blue tongue oh, lizard. Oh, blue tongue lizard. Oh, good work. Sorry. Yes, blue tongue lizard. Well done. We always we. Why don't we slip one to Joe now? I think any Joe. No, no, just grab your note. Have a look, Joe, in your um. Messages in one sec, and I'll just give it to you this second. There we go. Okay. Two words. First, First word. word. Driving, Driving car, truck, bus. Down. Down. Train. Uh, underground, Driving down. Underground railway. Hill. Climbing. Steep. Uh, a funicular. <laughs> Gone. Uh, driving. Okay, so it can't be a funicular. Station. Driving, driving down. Someone said a tank. No, that's fine. Tunnel. Someone, someone said it. Someone said it. What did they say? Driving. Tank. Mistake. Descent. Driving. driving down. Filling the tank. Pump. The petrol. Petrol station. Yes. yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, beautiful. All right, thank you. All right, I think three three should be enough. I think. Yes. Excellent. All right, so let's let's uh, go back to and play sort of. Let's go back to where was I? Okay. Hey Graham, are we back on? That's better. Okay. Nice. Okay. So what we've got here is people who are having to communicate with their normal mode of communication taken away from them, which is exactly what a charade is. Now. This is a very basic level of language of managing language barriers. So let me let me sort of talk a little bit about what's involved when you're talking to someone from an, from another language group who's not who's not a native English speaker. All right. So one of the things that we tend to do. Let's see. Oh, we're not working. Ah, here we go. Some of the potential challenges that people might face if they're not native English speakers and they're in an English speaking environment like Toastmasters is culture specific references. So those of you who are attending who didn't grow up in Australia, how many people back home do you think will know what a blue tongued lizard is? <laughs> exactly. So one of the things that people often aren't that conscious of is the fact that a lot of the words and the phrases that we use are quite specific to the country that we live in. So what I've got in that little picture, for example, is, is a picture from the Garden of Eden when Eve is reaching for the fruit. And people will talk about something called, they'll be talking in their, they'll be giving their Toastmasters speech and they'll say something like, oh, well, this is a bit of a forbidden fruit, not realizing, of course, this is a biblical reference. So people who come from a non-Western country where they're not familiar with Christian, Christian mythology, for example, might be completely at a loss. Just like someone who grew up in another country will not ever know that there's a, something called a blue colored cover will not actually know that there's such a thing as a blue tongued lizard, which means it's almost impossible for them to guess. Another one, which, which I got uh, Judy to do first, the term CBD is something a lot of Australians just take it for granted that everyone knows what a CBD is. But the truth is that's only used in the Southern Hemisphere. So if you go to South Africa, people will know what the CBD is, but even if you go to London or New York, they won't know what they mean, what you mean if you say CBD. They might talk about downtown or the center of town, but they certainly won't use the term CBD. So in terms of other things, which might be tricky in terms of vocabulary for people from other countries, one is the sorts of slang we tend to use. Now I'm not talking about really obvious things like fair dinkum, which most Australians would perhaps understand that that's something that someone from overseas might not know, but things like canceled, things like, things like talking about, oh, that was chockers, that was chock-a-block, or yeah, I've been flat out, 
there's lots of phrases that we use, which we're not that conscious of the fact that they are quite unique to Australian slang. And when people hear them, people who grew up with a different version of English, even native English speakers from another country may not understand. Such as petrol station, which we saw Joe doing before, a lot of people who've studied English as a second language will have studied US English, and they'll know it as a gas station rather than as a petrol station. So they have a different vocabulary based on the sort of English that they learned. Other things that we use a lot in Australian English include idioms. If you say, oh, let's hit the road, people say, with what? And I've heard of people being told, you know, oh, um, put your thinking cap on and people reaching for their hat and putting their hat on because they don't understand that this is an idiom and it means I'd like you to start coming up with some ideas or coming up with some suggestions. Other things you might see problems with, uh, see challenges around, are things like euphemisms. Now, this is something I saw when I was working at Deakin University and I went to a nursing class where the woman was talking about obesity and she didn't want to use the word fat because she feels that in Australia, culturally, that's a bit of a taboo thing. So she said, well, if you come from a big bone family, you might be at risk. And I could just see all the international students looking baffled and wondering there was some kind of bone disorder she was talking about that they didn't know about. Something else we use a lot as native English speakers is subtext. When we say, can I help you? That's a yes, no question. So someone who's not a native English speaker may say, yes, and not realize that that's the subtext is really, what would you like me to do for you? Not a yes, no question saying, can I help you? The same with see you later. I remember talking to some international students who say, oh, Australians are a bit insincere. They pretend to be your friend and say they want to see you later. But if you grab your phone and say, oh, great, I'd love to see you later, when? They realize that that's just a way of saying goodbye that's softened. It doesn't mean they physically want to see them later. So for those of us who have a lot of people who are not native English speakers in our Toastmasters clubs, what sorts of things can we do to try and make things to support our non-native English speaking Toastmasters members? One thing that really helps a lot is putting things in writing. So when you've got the agenda, making sure people flagging with people that the information they're hearing flying past them in spoken English at 100 miles an hour are actually available for them on the meeting agenda, on the Toastmasters website, on a piece of paper that you can, you know, on a glossary or something that you can specifically provide them if they need it, is it's much easier to figure out written English than it is to figure out spoken English, because spoken English evaporates straight away, whereas things that are written down, things that are printed, they can sneak home, they can use their, use their app, they can take it to their friend who's got better English and ask them. So putting things in writing is a real way you can support people without it causing, causing too much disruption to the flow of your meetings, flagging it with people to put things in writing and they can just use a translation app with their phone. Another thing to do is to remember that when you've learned a, sec learned a second language, usually you have a fairly narrow vocabulary in it. So if we're a native English speaker, we might know many, way, many words for the person who's driving a car. We could talk about a chauffeur and that's a specific type of driver. And if you go to go through CityLink, for example, they'll say motorists are advised, motorists please note. And most people who learn English as a second language will have no idea that motorist basically means driver. So trying to make sure you use the most everyday word, which is the one they're likely to have learned in the classroom is good. The other thing we can do is to be careful about not using too many odd acronyms, using lots of strange jargon, using lots of technical terms or slang that people are unlikely to be familiar with. Or if you do decide to use slang, then explaining what it means. Uh, when, when someone was at an international student orientation day, for example, and they said, oh, well, if you want to head into the CBD, make sure, make sure that you top up your Mikey. And honestly, he might as well have been speaking in Greek <laughs> because none of them knew what a Mikey was. He, did, he didn't explain what a Mikey was or put a picture of it up, and they didn't know what the CBD was. So that just gives you a few examples of what are some of the things which can be difficult in terms of vocabulary when you've got people in your club who are not native English speakers and come from a different society where they're not familiar with the same words that you tend to see in as a native speaker in Australia. Thank you, that was really insightful. And these things were a big challenge for me when I first arrived in Australia. And it is still a challenge when I try to teach them to my students. So we will now move on to, to the break. And we will have a 10 minute break and we'll be back here at uh, 26 past eight. Mm -hmm. So see you later. Okay, see you later everybody. Welcome back everyone. 
that was really a fun activity, Fiona. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Oh, and when I first came to Australia, I had a very thick accent. And it was very hard for native speakers to understand me. So I had to do a lot of adjustment. I even actually hired a voice coach to get rid of my strong Malaysian accent. And I was guilty of, of this crime of speaking too fast. And now being a teacher, I am at the receiving end of this problem. I have students who tend to say things that I can't really understand. So to, to overcome that, I've I had had a few a few t techniques that I I employ. I get them to do reading practice and send me recording. I get them to do ch chat GPT conversation. But I would like to hear from Fiona. What are the things that uh, non-native Toastmaster members can do? To make themselves easier to understand. Right. Well, one of the things I think is quite helpful, which is less putting the spotlight on those members rather shifting it to the native speakers, is just helping native speakers understand that an accent's not something you can sort of switch off overnight, no matter how convenient it would be for everyone concerned. As, as I mentioned earlier, an accent is essentially using the sounds and structures of your native language and using them in your second language. So speaking English using the sounds of Chinese and so on. So what tends to happen, just to clarify how accents work, is rules that apply in your native language getting applied in English where they're actually not for English. So when you're a native English speaker, say you're getting someone to say numbers, you'll often hear people who are from, say, China, saying five, six. And why are they putting an extra uh on the end of those? It's because in Chinese, there are very few ways of ending a letter. All, all words end in either a vowel, an N or an NG. So when you have a number, a word like eight, and it's got a T on the end, they sort of instinctively put an extra vowel, say eight. Whereas in Vietnamese, Vietnamese tends to have, doesn't have many letters on the end either, but that, what they tend to do is clip them off. So they say five, C, seven, eight, they'll clip them off. So these sorts of things takes quite a while for people to adapt. And if they're not engaging a lot with locals, then it's often their accent is it's very hard for their accent to sort of start to diminish because they're not having it modeled and they're not finding people not understanding them and helping them to modify it along the way. Now, if people are keen to kind of speed up the process, um, one thing they do, of course, when they join Toastmasters, it's a great opportunity to do that, to have to listen to native Australian English speakers and to practice speaking with Australians. Uh, I would recommend to anyone who wants to look at their accent, start listening to Australian TV so you can adjust to it. And if necessary, put the captioning on so you can get used to the way the sounds that you know from written English sound when you're when they're spoken in Australian English. There's also other things you can do to speed up the process. I mean, one thing is what you did, which is hire someone to help you with your accents. Now, if you're hiring someone, a professional accent coach, that's quite an expensive business. And I should know because I actually do it. I'm usually teaching university professors how to pronounce uh, names in Asian languages for graduation ceremonies. But there are actually quite a few free accent coaches you can find on YouTube, for example. So if you go and have a look on YouTube, there'll be some people on YouTube who've uploaded videos of themselves teaching people how to make the sounds, the sounds of the words that they're familiar with in a more Australian way. Uh, one of the other things that can be quite useful, if you find you want to have more contact with English speaking, native English speaking people, is there are various, various reasonably inexpensive language platforms online. There is a, a place, there is a website called italki. So it's like I, the word talk with an I either end. And there are many people on there who are students looking to make a bit of pocket money. And they're quite happy to, you know, for you to pay them a very small amount and they'll sit there and talk to you in, in their native language. So that could actually speed up the process too in a quite inexpensive way. Thanks, Fiona. That's very really some helpful resources and tips there. Um, I'll make sure to use them in future. Now, understanding each other under between native speakers and non-native speakers is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about native speakers. So, in, specifically in con in the context of Australia, where one third of Australians are foreign-born. Mm -hmm. and where education industry makes up a massive uh, uh, proportion of our export income, where tourists, we receive about over 7 million tourists every year. And and also, because our workplace is getting increasingly diverse and companies are getting increasingly global. So my next question is, how can native speakers improve their understanding of accents? Well, 
uh, other than some of the things that I mentioned earlier, a lot of it, a lot of it applies the same way. But the thing is, with the native speakers, they've got the advantage because they're already speaking a language which they're very comfortable with. What they need to do is adjust to the way those words sound when someone's first language is is Urdu or when the first lang first language is Hindi or something like that. Some of the things that, that can be helpful, other than listening to lots of speeches until your ear starts to adjust, some of the things that I talked about for non-native speakers also apply to native speakers. For example, with, with AI, we can actually film someone giving a speech and then get AI to caption it automatically. And then captions and using subtitles, if you go and watch, let, watch uh, movies or TV or shows, or even someone just giving a speech with an accent, learning how to fit the sounds that you expect into the sounds that you're hearing, which from with someone who's not a native speaker of English, can really be an interesting way to get, get to, to adapt to it. So that's one of the things that I, I used to do a lot with my Chinese conversation partner. I'd encourage her to go and watch, watch Australian movies and, and put the subtitles on. So even though her English was excellent, she wasn't used to how the words sound when they've given an Australian twist. So that's one of the ways you can help adjust yourself to accents. But one of the best things you can do is find a Toastmasters club with a lot of speakers who have the accent that you're trying to learn. And because when the more you hear it, the more, the more quickly you're going to start to adjust. Thanks, Vera. Perhaps uh, you want to demonstrate this with an activity? Well, with my activity, the next activity is not specifically looking at accents so much as it is looking at grammar. So this may not be quite as exciting sounding as vocabulary. I mean, grammar is not a subject that sets many people's heart on fire. However, it is an important part of the difficulties in cross-cultural communication is actually about how language, language, different languages fit words together in a different way. Now, one of the most problematic areas where grammar can be a problem is that grammar is quite closely linked to showing politeness, to etiquette, to being, to being polite to people. So what I've got in this next exercise is a way to kind of deconstruct, kind of take apart how native English speakers see politeness, how politeness works in English. So let me just put up another slide for you and we'll have a little look at how politeness works in English and why it can be tricky it can be easy for people who are not native English speakers to not come across as politely as they might like to. All right, so I'd like those of you who have a dog in particular. Now, dog owners, focus closely. Those of you who've never owned a dog, listen in and help understand the ways of the dog owner. All right, so here is the scenario. You've had a long day at work, you're a bit tired and you, you're coming home with a little bag of your takeaway meal because you couldn't bear the thought of cooking. You pop it on the kitchen table and then your dog comes storming into the room having clearly a quite erratic day. So roar, 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 dog's barking and running around, and, oh, you've got a headache, and then tries to jump up on the table and pull your dinner off and eat it. What are you going to say to your dog? So Rhiannon, what would you say to your dog? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. I can hear you. Uh, I have had dogs before, but I've got a cat right now who would mm -hmm. do the same thing. Yep. Just be more sneaky with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, if it was one of those long days, I probably will snap. Mm -hmm. But I would like to. Snap? I can uh, use your dog. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah, I would snap and then feel guilty. All right. But what would you actually say? What words would you use? Give it an example of what you might say to your dog who's barking loudly. Ruff, 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 says your dog. I would, well, I would say, shut up. Come on, be quiet. What's wrong with you? Okay, shut up. Like, what's wrong with try you? Try talking to him like he's going to talk back to me. Okay, and then he's trying to grab your food off the table. What would you do? What would you say to him then? No, 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 no. Yep. And what do you want him to do? What might you do to kind of set, calm him down a bit? I would like tell him like, or more or less sit, like give him commands to redirect him. Beautiful. Now, now we've just, just talked about our dog. Notice the way you talk to your dog. Shut up. No, 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 no. Sit. You notice how it's very, very direct. There's no fancy stuff around the edges because that will be lost on your dog. So you, you're very direct. You're very forthright. Your tone, your, your tone of your voice goes down. No, sit. All right, let's have scenario number two. Let's go back to our picture. All right, so here we have our dog. Okay, here's the new scenario. So you're back at work again the next day and there's a very distinguished guest speaker coming to town and your manager comes in and says, 
uh, all of our people that we had organized to kind of play security and crowd control at the event, they're all sick, they've all got COVID, what are we going to do? Um, can you come in and help out? And being an obliging sort of person, you say, sure. And he says, okay, this is what you need to do. There's going to be catering on the table, but that's not for people at this seminar. So make sure people don't eat the catering on that table. And, and I want to make sure, we, so that we give a good impression to the distinguished speaker, that everybody is seated and quiet before the event starts. Can you say, sure, easy, I can do that. So there you go, the, the uh, distinguished speaker is on the stage and they're signalling at you to say, all right, then make everyone settle down. And on the other side of the room, you see an elderly gentleman immediately reaching out, reaching out to take some of the canapes off the other people's catering while talking loudly into his mobile phone. You think, oh, some people just have no respect. So you march over to the elderly gentleman to tell him to stop eating the other people's catering, sit down quietly, and lo and behold, who should it be but, let's see if I can get this to actually come up, but it is King Charles. Oh, now you have a problem. Because King Charles is there eating other people's food, talking noisily when he's supposed to be sitting down quietly and starting and waiting for the distinguished speaker to start. And it is your job to tell him to stop eating that food, to sit down quietly so the event can begin. Now, the problem is, of course, your manager who's watching from the other side of the, the room is signaling more and more frantically because, you know, come on, come on, this is your job. He doesn't know that it's King Charles. So then, Rhiannon, how would you approach this? Uh, well, being half British, I know the rules about when mm -hmm. you approach a royal member, mm -hmm. you have to, your majesty, and bow, All right. uh, or courtesy for a female, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then wait for him to respond to me before I could say anything back. Yes. Now, he has to acknowledge me, otherwise mm -hmm. I can't speak to him after that. All right, yep. And, uh... Of course, there will be secu his security looking at me, so it's kind of intense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me, Your Royal Highness. I'm afraid that food is not for you. It is for the next meeting. I apologize for any inconvenience. Okay. If you wish for any food or beverage, we are happy to supply. But unfortunately, this food is not what we're offering today. Mm -hmm. Now, you also need to shut him up and get him to sit down. So, sit. Stop oh. that. Probably not going to go down. How would you put it for his match? It would be much appreciated from our company and from the people coming here today to see you more engaged with us yep. and to put your phone away and to engage with us if you so wish to, so kindly. Nice, nice. All right, now you look at that. Okay, everybody else, Rhiannon, with the inside knowledge of the, uh, you know, the British blood flowing in her veins, how, what is the difference between the way she gave those instructions to her dog and the way she gave those instructions to His Majesty? I feel terrible as a dog owner. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. That's all right. Okay, but do we have any, any volunteers who are going to say how, what was it different? How did she address them differently? Okay, I can't, I can't see people. Let's look at gallery. Do we have any volunteers who are happy to explain? Annie? Can I answer? Oh, or... yeah, sure. Nola, Nola, by all means. All right. I am the owner of the dog firstly, am I? Mm -hmm. oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying, I'm getting you to kind of analyse the difference between the way you give the instructions to the dog and the way you give the instructions to the king. My goodness, Rhiannon, and you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> I have had a golden retriever uh, for 17 years. We've just lost him. And I never said shut up to that dog for the <laughs> entire time we had him for 17 years. It's just a different way of parenting maybe. But I always got down, as I do with children, to the same height as the dog if they're a problem. And I don't know, maybe it's golden retrievers, but I think I speak golden retriever. And if I said to him, you must be quiet. Somehow he understood what I was saying. Um, I've got the intelligence of a golden retriever, I think. But when you were speaking about the king, you were so um, sure about the etiquette and I would have no idea of what was expected of me in that, even though I'm a royalist, 
I love the king and I love the queen and love Princess Diana, who is still on our screens about 20 times a day, can I say. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it comes down with knowledge. Maybe because I've had dogs all of my life, maybe I have no, now know what works with them. And you have more knowledge in the protocol that um, needs to be applied to the king. So I would fail with the king, but if you don't mind me saying so, I think you failed with your dog. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, I've mostly owned cats most of my life, so I'm not a real full dog owner. So you're right. I don't really have big knowledge with dogs. Yep. And I, I would say, like, even with my cats, I have snapped a few times and then realized no that's not the way you do it they're not going to respond to negativity like that Thanks, yeah. okay so what Thanks, i was so really hoping to highlight though is the different way we'd give those same instructions to the king compared to the dog because with the yes. king there's more obligation to be polite and respectful yes. so what, what you'll notice though is both differences in grammar and differences in tone when you're being polite in english one of the things that you'll do when speaking to the dog, as I said, very short, abrupt commands with a falling tone. Whereas with the king, your voice becomes higher and more flowing. Excuse me, your majesty, if it wouldn't trouble you too much, could you, could you possibly refrain from sampling those refreshments? <laughs> Notice you start to use refreshments instead of food and beverage instead of drinks. So you're changing the words that you use to make them more formal. And also that your grammar becomes a lot more fancy. This is how we show we're being polite. Talking to the dog, very direct, issuing commands. The king, you're phrasing it as a question. You're using a lot of fancy grammar and higher level words and so on. And we're asking, offering him a choice. We don't want him to think that we're imposing on him. So when we so to decode how politeness works in English, we tend to insert all these extra polite words that we didn't usually use with their dogs, unless you're as polite to them as Nola is. <laughs> provide an explanation. We explain that the speaker's about to start to kind of give some context high flowing intonation rather than sick becomes a different way of speaking to people and you yeah. tend to use much more fancy grammar and this is the most difficult part for non-native english speaker i was wondering if you could possibly is grammatically very very tricky i was the verb to be in past imperfect first person form followed by wondering <laughs> present participle if you could possibly and we haven't even got to the point yet so there are a couple of things. Would you like to say that again, please, and explain what <laughs> yeah. when, I'm just saying that I was wondering if you could possibly. It's actually yeah. a grammatically very tricky sentence. It's a very complicated grammar. Yep. And for a native English speaker, you don't need to think about it. So so much so that as a native English speaker, Nola, um, yeah. I explain the grammar that you just use naturally, and you, yeah. you're sort of a bit, what, sorry? <laughs> what was all yep. that about? Because most people don't study grammar, even if, if they're native English speakers. But if you're no. trying to piece that together from what yes, you learned in the classroom, it's very tricky. Yes. All right. Other things we tend to do when we're, we're being formal, we start using passive voice. Toastmasters members are required to complete complete two levels of, you know, that sort of thing. We talk about policy and we sort of, could I make a suggestion? So we phrase it as a question rather than as a statement. So what we see there is that because of this difficult grammar and all these extra rules about how your voice should sound and how to approach something, what, you, what you'll see is that when you're a native English speaker, the politer you're trying to be, often the harder you get to understand. And when you're talking to a native, native English speaker, they will often come across a bit abrupt. Why? Because the fancy stuff is difficult. It's quite easy to say, oh, yes, please sit down. No, you must give me this. Because that's very direct, simple grammar. And to be polite requires a very high level of grammar, which a lot of non-native English speakers, speakers don't have. So what you'll see is because of the difficulties with grammar, non-native English speakers can come across as impolite or pushy when they have no intention of doing so whatsoever. I realize we've, we've run a bit over time that activity, so don't worry, Graham, I, I did notice. Um, so Hanif, heading back to Hanif. Thank you, Vienna. That was really fascinating. And I can certainly relate to some aspect of it. For example, the word please, it doesn't exist mm. in Malay language or in Urdu. So I really struggled with, with the word please when I first came to Australia. Mm. Let's get back. Actually, if I could just interrupt briefly, one of the things I've heard native English speaking backpackers say, there's only two things you need to learn in any foreign language, and that's please and thank you. And as you can see, there is not necessarily a please or even a thank you of the same sort that we use in English in other languages at all. Okay, back to you, Hanif. Interesting. 
Okay. Fiona, now let's get back to Toastmaster because oh. that's what that's why we're all here after all. A couple of years ago, Judy actually uh, went to Sri Lanka to attend a wedding of one of our uh, club members, Amila. And she had an absolute blast there and she came back reporting the fun time she had there. And this was one of the benefits we had having uh, non-native speaker uh, members in our club. So my next question is, what are the benefits of having such uh, culturally and linguistically diverse members in, in our clubs? invites to weddings in Sri Lanka for a start. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of it is that ultimately Toastmasters is about telling stories and about telling personal stories most of the time. And by having a diverse Toastmasters membership, you also have very, very diverse stories. It's education, but education presented in entertaining story form rather than in dry history, history lesson uh, form in a classroom. It helps you to make a genuine personal connection with people who are demographically very different from you. And one of the things in Toastmasters that I, I'm always impressed by is not just diversity of culture, but diversity of age, diversity of occupation. It really helps people to form connections with people who are very different from themselves. And that sort of, that encourages sort of acceptance. It encourages, it broadens minds. It really enriches you as a person. Thanks, Fiona. Mm -hmm. Now that leads to the next question as to how uh, our Toastmaster Club can be more inclusive when it comes to uh, culturally and linguistically diverse members? Well, some of these things I mentioned earlier in those language activities, one is making sure you provide information, not just in spoken form, reminding people when their information is available in writing, because that's much more cross-cultural communication friendly, because it's not limited to being able to process it when it comes out of your mouth and before it disappears. There's also videos. One of the things that you'll see on the Toastmasters International website is there's lots of illustration by video. And something that I always encourage lecturers when I work at universities to do is to model the behavior you want students to give. So by showing, showing them, they can watch videos of people doing a table topic and understand from that how a table topic works once you've seen a few. And that takes the pressure off the club having to mentor them. And the mentor can just fine tune things and they can learn a lot by looking at those videos. Some of the other things, other things that we can do to support them is to, I mean, is to provide men mentoring. But just to remember, if you've read about it, you've seen something modelled, it makes it much easier for someone to do it for the first time. So in fact, the way Toastmasters meeting is, meetings are designed is actually quite helpful for that. Something else which I think, going to my name pronunciation uh, speciality that I do a lot of at work, is that often Toastmasters of any culture, native English speakers and people from from non-English speaking countries alike, is pronouncing each other's names can be a real sticking point because we use each other's names a lot in Toastmasters. And something that I do, and I was talking to uh, Nola a bit about beforehand, was writing out phonetically how a name is pronounced. That's especially good in Zoom to have that because I remember when we were, we were meeting online in 2020 and 2021, there was a Vietnamese member at Williamstown called Phuong, and it's P-H-U-O-N-G, and I noticed people weren't calling on her much. And I thought it's because they don't know how to pronounce her name. So I sent her a private message in Zoom and told her to put F-E-R-N-G, Fern with the word letter G on the end, put it in brackets after your name in your Zoom box. And after that, people started calling on her a bit more, noticeably more, because they felt confident. They weren't nervous about offending her by pronouncing her name wrong. And if you're doing on-site meetings, you can actually put that on the, you can put that on your agendas. You could put that on your free toast host website, and you can put it on people's name tags so that people can address each other with confidence and not be worried about offending each other or too scared to call on someone for table topics or something because they don't know how to say their name. Thanks, Fiona. That's a very helpful tips there. Now, I, I happen to watch a viral TikTok video of name pronunciation that you 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 performed at at a convocation in Queensland University, mm -hmm. and the comments were simply amazing. People were really impressed. Now, Dale Kenner, you once said that the the sweetest sound that anyone could hear is their own name. Now, you are very passionate about name pronunciation. You have run workshop even at uh, William Towns Club, Toastmaster Club teaching people how to pronounce names. So now what else can you share uh, in terms of insight when it comes to name pronunciation? Well, I think we assume all too readily that we really ought to be able to pronounce anyone's name. 
it's just a sort of a given. And I think if you've grown up in an English speaking society surrounded by people who are other native speakers, native, native English speakers, that's something you are, you can expect to be able to pronounce, how, pronounce Annie and Janine and David because they're names that you're going to have encountered in one way or another growing up. But when you're encountering names of people who've grown up in Vietnam or people who've grown up in Sri Lanka or people who've grown up in Poland, you really haven't been exposed to those names and been taught how to pronounce them. So I think one of the things we need to keep in mind is not to put so much pressure on ourselves that we should just be able to do it because we shouldn't. We, we don't know how letters are pronounced in other languages because we do not study it. I mean, one of the reasons why I had to develop a workshop to teach people how letters are pronounced in Vietnamese and how letters are pronounced in, in Japanese and things is because there's no other place to learn it. I mean, there are, you can actually look, look up these things online, but if you say to people, it's just not good enough, you've got to show more respect and get people's names right, you need to also accompany that by giving people tools that they can actually figure out someone's name with or tools and strategies. There's a few things which I could suggest for people which might be useful. One is that phonetic transcription thing that I said. But the other thing is you can, certainly on LinkedIn, you can actually upload a little audio clip of the person saying their name so that before you have to ring them, you can press the button and listen to it. And, and the good thing about that, which is in some ways less intrusive than asking the person themselves is you don't have to ask the person 10 times, but you can press that button 10 times and the audio button will not mind. They won't find this and, and you're not embarrassed because it's just the machine. <laughs> it's just a machine just being pressed the button, uh, telling you how to pronounce things over and over. The other thing you can do, of course, is write down your own little phonetic cheat notes under their name on your agenda and perhaps, you know, sneakily put that into the phone under their phone number so that you have a little guideline on how to use their name. And if you're comfortable and the other person's comfortable, one of the things I've even done is you ask them, do you mind if, could you, I, could I record you saying your name on my phone? And that way you've got it. You've got your own little audio button you can just carry around with you. There's also, one of the things I've also noticed is that AI is not too bad at name pronunciation. Certainly my, when I tried a few months ago, I thought, I don't think I'd better tell people to do this. But now I can say, look, 70, 80% hit rate is not bad. It's a lot better than you looking at a name and having no clue. So you can actually ask ChatGPT, uh, what language is this from and how do you pronounce it? And, you know, it's a reasonably, you get you're, you're, with a bit of luck, you'll get a reasonably accurate thing. Or if you just ask it, what language is this from, going to Google Translate also gives you a fairly reasonable reasonable way of finding it out. So if you've got someone's name and it's, and it's Arabic or something like that, if you go, perhaps this is Microsoft Translate is better at Arabic, it's an inside tip, put their name in, in, in the English side, put English to Arabic, and then press the audio button on the Arabic side to get a reasonable, if not perfect, rendition of how to say their name. So I think if you give people tools, as well as telling them, make it more effort with people's names, then they have something to make effort with. So that's something I'm very much on. Don't, don't just tell people to be more respectful, teach them what they need to do to know how to pronounce names. Thanks, Fiona. Again, a very helpful tips there. So that basically concludes uh, our session. Now I'm gonna open the floor to uh, for a question and answer from the audience. Perhaps we could get first question from somebody who whose background is non-native English. Anyone would like to ask question? Somebody from non-English speaking background? If we have any. We have Aravind, we have Jasli Wu. If either of them are feeling bold enough to speak up. <clears throat> Sorry, hi. Hi. This is Jasley. Hi. Hi. Um, I yeah, English is my additional language. I um I don't have a question, but I just wanted to comment on how inspiring um you just mentioned about pronounce another person's name. Um, there is a member in our club, he has a very long last name. <laughs> um, I think everybody's a little bit um afraid of pronouncing it wrong so even even our club um a president he's kind of avoiding it but it's so inspiring i'm just um googling it i'm going my my goal this week is to, to learn his last name and address him when i at, when i meet him at the meeting again well my tip for very long names is cut them up into bite-sized chunks and put them together put put the, put the chunks together with little plus signs or hyphens in between and read it like a sentence rather than trying to read it all at once makes it a lot easier Thank you. That's a fantastic tip. Thank you. I'll, I'll practice a few times. Good. <laughs> Thank Good. you. I hope he's happy. I hope he's delighted and surprised to hear it said correctly. 
good. I think a person, uh, Fiona, I think a person with a difficult name probably doesn't mind you asking, could you please pronounce your name for me? Like even if you do that in the club, we've done that sometimes. Mm -hmm. We had the person, I think Addie Martin actually did it one time, said, look, we, I noticed that everybody's having difficulty pronouncing so-and-so's name. Would you stand up and say it? And then we all had to practice saying it. Yeah. And they, they weren't embarrassed at all. I think they were just grateful mm. that mm. people mm. could pronounce their names then. Mm. Yeah, I think it, it really depends on, I think it's a bit of an individual thing. It may also be just how much, A, how much, how much, how much importance they're placing on it. Because a lot of people are happy to adapt a bit when they come to a new country. But also, I mean, it's often if they're being asked continually, on the other hand, it could start to get a little bit burdensome. It's one of the things also because you can't just listen to a name once and then expect to be able to pronounce it perfectly necessarily. A lot of native English speakers listening to a, a very unfamiliar name which isn't spelt the way they expect it to be or is very long, their auditory memory, their, their memory for that sound, locking it into the memory is quite difficult as well. That's why I sort of, I recommend recording it in some way. So once you've asked that person, having some way of writing it down or recording it so that you don't have to keep on asking them and every new member or every guest doesn't have to kind of run the gamut of, oh no, this name, it's too scary to pronounce. Nola has respectfully raised her hand. Oh, I have and it's, and it's so unlike me. I have <laughs> heard that Flinders Lane do a wonderful thing with their very diverse membership whereby the Toastmasters promise is said in the language of the um, member of that club. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine how wonderful that must be for that member to be freed and be able to speak that language, but then educates everyone in that club in mm. a different way of listening. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It is. Yes. It's an illustration of how good a context Toastmasters is for creating those cross-cultural ties. That's that's exactly right. And we had a, a new member in our club at Wandon, a Miller. When he first came, every meeting he would have a word that he would write down, didn't always spell it right, of course, and he would ask after the meeting, Nola, tell, because I was his mentor, please mm. tell me how you pronounce this and what does it mean? Mm. And so he's been with us about six years now. So we effectively, in his words, say we have taught him English one word at a time and his language mm -hmm. now is excellent mm. there you go it just goes to show yeah, i think yeah. hanif have you found toastmasters played a role in lifting your english standard as well oh that's it, it certainly did mm -hmm. and not not just that it actually inspired me to do so many things in, in fact the the very thing that i'm doing now english toast, english classes and 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 opening plan plan for opening toastmaster club really? is yeah. all being inspired by Toastmaster. Rihanna so has also uh, enough. respectfully raised her hand and uh, this will have to be the last question, I think. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yes. Uh, it's not necessarily a cultural thing, but it can be. People with disabilities, some will talk in sign language mm -hmm. or that, like as you said before, people, it takes time like if you have six second pause, it's awkward. Mm -hmm. But for people with disability, sometimes it takes them that long to process and to think of a response. So for me, being a disability support specialist, that's not odd for me. I'm used to waiting. Mm -hmm. And it's um, it sometimes it's because I'm autistic and ADHD. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I cannot enunciate, not because I don't want to learn or anything but I just cannot pronounce or do something with a thing I just say something completely different unintentionally of course but there's different things like that you know, like people with disabilities how they communicate a lot of people do not understand and again it's it's harder for people with disabilities just like mm. for foreigners even to understand English well I have to say when my my own son was diagnosed with autism I was struck by just how many of the things which applied in autism apply as well to someone who's been taken out of their own culture. So in yeah. autism, it's a matter of finding it difficult to read the cues in your own culture. For someone who's come from another culture, they can't read them because these are cues which they're not familiar with. They're used to the cues at home, but when they come to another country, they don't know the cues. 
So I remember sort of thinking about how I could draw on my own professional techniques to help my son adjust more, adjust to being engaging with people socially. So um, how do you um, go over the hurdle if you can't enunciate a certain vowel or the way that that country would pronounce it? You pronounce it what you know. Um, well, that's another thing which I'm constantly teaching academics before they read at graduation, how to try and change the way they say things. Um, often, often that's just part of your accent. If it's just part of your accent, that's a matter of the onus being on the native speaker in the equation, I think should be there a little more to, for them to adjust to this is how that sound, sound, that sound is like when it's coming from this person. Um, but in terms of, I mean, you can also, I imagine, be trained to, to pronounce that sound a little more closely to the way it actually is. I've been founding when my son started to learn French, I was able to teach him how to make his vowel sounds in a much more French way by saying, okay, lift the sound up in your mouth and explaining how to move his lips and his tongue in a way which created a more French sound. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you, Fiona. thank you, everyone. I just want to thank you again, uh, Fiona, for, for such a wonderful session. It, for someone like me, who, for whom multiculturalism is a center, I still had, I still learned a lot and how lucky are we are we are in Toastmaster community to have someone like you to to be willing to come and share your insight and expertise. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Back Good to you, Annie. To speak. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Hanif and Fiona. I do hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did and got so much information out of it. Really, you both did a brilliant job. I personally learned so much and I do believe this is a wonderful resource for District 73. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Please let other members of your club know that they're in, probably in about a week or so this recording will be up. And so there's a lot of gems in there and a lot of things where there's messages in the chat saying, oh, that might be a good idea for the club around name pronunciation or whatever it was. And Rhiannon's comments at the end about drawing that out to disability was interesting as well. So, so many, so many gems came through that. Thank you so much. We will close just to remind everybody while you're here that our next education and training session will be in the, in the, how do I put it, the beautifully capable and creative hands of Nola Sharp and a team of people around her who are going to look at how we can bring a whole lot of novelty into our Toastmasters meetings. So it's going to be called something like Nola's Novel November because it will be held in November on November the 24th, that's a Sunday. It will be in the Hawthorne Library where we held our last hybrid meeting. So please, if you're interstate or you can't get there, please zoom in. If you can get there, come along to the Hawthorne Library at three o'clock. There'll be um, emails going out about this ahead of time. Um, and afterwards, join us at the hotel as well for a, a nice dinner. So we do hope people can come because uh, knowing Nola and the team around her, it's going to be a hoot. I can say that I don't know whether what the what the definition of that is in another language or whether maybe someone from another culture won't understand what I mean when I say it's a hoot, but it will be absolutely a hoot. Once again, massive thank you to Fiona. You're remarkable. Honey, if you were the perfect person to chair that. Uh, and I, once again, big shout out to Graham Dunlop for making it all happen too. On that note, I think one more round of applause. We can all go and uh, get a nice cup of tea and call it a, an evening. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Bye-bye.